Chris and Nikki and I had an awesome opportunity this week. Um, Nikki, of course, works at Gallatin College, which is a part of MSU, and, uh, and Nikki made us aware that there was a guest speaker that was, that was coming as a, as a guest of the president of MSU. His name is Anthony Ray Hinton, and we went to hear him share his story this week. Were any of you there? Were any of you there besides the three of us? We didn't see any connectors. I wish I could have... I wish I could have known the impact that he would have. I would have invited all of you to be there. Uh, but I want to share just a little bit of Anthony Ray Hinton's story. Of course, he's written a book, and it's up there on the screen. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm going to. Anthony Ray Hinton is from the state of Alabama, in, and in 1986, he was falsely accused of murdering two white people in two different crimes in the state of Alabama, and he was convicted and given a a death sentence for these two murders that he did not uh, commit. And he was placed in prison in solitary confinement on death row, and he served 30 years of a sentence before the Supreme Court of the United States overturned his conviction, and they were able to prove unequivocally that not only was he misidentified by one of the victim's families, but also the evidence was tampered with, and, and, and it, was, it was unequivocal that he did not commit these two murders. And so he was released after serving 30 years in solitary confinement in an Alabama state prison. You can only imagine. And he told us his story, and, and, and what an amazing story. He shared that at, after he was convicted, um, he, he became very angry at God. He was raised by a mother who raised him to know and love Jesus, uh, strong moral convictions in his home. But of course, after he had told the truth and, and presented himself as a man of integrity, uh, the, the prejudice in, in that, that court system was so mind-boggling that, of course, he was asking himself, where is the faithfulness of God in my life? And so he shared with us that he was so angry at God that he, he essentially shook his fist at God, and, and I don't really understand the connection, but he said that for three years, he didn't talk to anybody. He was silent for three years. And I think somehow that silence was just a projection at God because he was so angry. And then slowly he began to realize that God could work through him in this incredibly ugly situation. It it was really an ugly situation. He shared with us that uh, the prosecutor was a white man, the judge was a white man, the jury was all white. The prosecutor had told him at the outset that he didn't really care if Anthony was guilty or not. He said, you people are committing these crimes all the time, and I'm going to send you to prison whether you did it or not. And so you can understand why somebody would get pretty angry at God. But after about three years, he began to realize that there was something that God had for him in this ugly, ugly world and in this ugly situation. And so one of the things that he did as a prisoner on death row was he started a book club. And he didn't go into a lot of detail about this book club because he's in solitary confinement, so I don't really understand the ins and outs, but evidently they must have had some time for socialization. And so he started a book club, and he shared with us that over the 30 years of his incarceration, by the time he was released, every person in his book club that had started with him was executed. He was the only person left alive at the very end. But in the midst of this book club that that he was the leader of, Uh, one day they had a person decide to join, another person on death row that came to join. His name was Henry Hayes, and Henry was a member of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. Henry had been convicted of beating, stabbing, and lynching a teenage black boy who was mentally delayed. And Henry came and wanted to join Anthony's book club. Now, how do you think Anthony felt about this man joining his 
book club. Here's Anthony, a black man who had been falsely accused and innocent of crimes on death row, rubbing shoulders with a white man who had lynched a black man and was rightfully incarcerated sitting on death row. What is Anthony going to do? I'm going to tell you, Chris and Nikki and I sat on the edge of our seats as Anthony told us about the choice he made when he was confronted with the choice of whether or not he was going to engage with Henry Hayes or reject him. I'm going to finish that story in a few minutes. And I've done this before and I forgot to come back, so you help me remember. <laughs> What, I'm, what I want to talk about today is the reality of Anthony's life is similar to the reality of your and my life. There is a confrontation that we engage in constantly between religion and the mission of Jesus. Anthony Ray understood the mission of Jesus because he was brought up to know and love Jesus and he was taught about the mission of Jesus. But he faced the same thing that a lot of us face, which is this, this conflict, this adversarial relationship between the mission of Jesus and the spirit of religion. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to unpack some of this with you and I'm going to ask you today to make a choice. What will you choose? Will you choose religion or will you choose the mission? It's a very clear choice, but maybe not an easy choice. Now, we are reading through the book of 1 Corinthians and I'm going to eventually get there. So if you've got your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians, hang with me, we'll get there eventually. But I, I, wanna, I want to build a basis for what we're going to talk about today in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9 today. And I want to start by talking about culture and religion. Here, here's what I see in, in history as well as in current events. Every culture embraces religion. Every culture embraces religion. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians, and this is a letter from Paul to a Christian church in the city of Corinth, and Corinth was a city who embraced religion. Corinth was a city that embraced polytheism, which means they worshiped many, many gods. In fact, as I was researching, uh, I, I, I I found out that in Corinth there were dozens and dozens of different deities that people would worship. And here's, here's just a few. Uh, they worshipped Aphrodite. This was probably the primary, primary religious center in, in Corinth. She was the goddess of love and beauty and fertility. So when people would go to worship Aphrodite, they were literally worshipping sex. They worshipped Poseidon, who was the Greek god of the sea. He was important to Corinthians because uh, sailors and fishermen often came into Corinth and they were seeking a, a, a God's help. And so this was, a, this was a God that they would do food sacrifices to, uh, to try to make him happy and, and, and give them prosperity in their seagoing professions. Another god that was very important in Corinth was the god Dionysus, or another name of Dionysus is Bacchus. You've probably heard of Dionysus or, god, or Bacchus, the god of food and wine and revelry. The Corinthians were a party city, and their religion was all about partying hardy. It was a pretty happening place. But contrast Corinth with, with the culture, the religion of Israel. Israel and that culture centered around Torah, the law, the, the law of Moses. And, and, and Jews, of course, were very concerned to this day, are very concerned with kosher eating. They were concerned with, what am I going to eat? Am I going to, no pork, no bacon, no ham, mate. Don't keep that shellfish away from me. Okay, this is very important to Jewish people. And of course, we read in the New Testament about the Jewish priority of circumcision, because if you were a Jewish man, this was the sign that you were a man of faith and that you trusted God as if you were circumcised. And so here in Corinth, in ancient Corinth, there's this, this Corinthian party worship alongside the Jewish 
worship of, of, of the Jewish law, and there was a conflict between these two religious practices in the city because Jews had settled in Corinth. But then what happened as, as the church began to grow in Corinth, these two cultures began to clash because the Jews believed that if you believed in God, you followed the rules, and the Corinthians believed that if you followed Jesus, you were free from the rules, and there was a clash of these religious cultures. Now, it's not very different in 21st century American, America, if you really think about it. In, in America, we have a pretty strong Christian culture, and it differs from place to place and from generation to generation, but if you've been around the block a few times, you know there's just things that culturally are important to Christians. Um, Depending on, on what generation you're in, it might be very important to you to say grace before your meals. Young people don't seem to think that's as important as some of us older people do. But that's, that, that's a, a value in our Christian culture. We listen to Christian music. There's a, a strong sense that using profanity is something that Christians don't do. Taking the Lord's name in vain is very offensive to many Christians. You vote the right way, you dress the right way, you don't have sex until you're married. And it used to be if you don't comply with all of these things, you'd be told by another Christian that you're going straight to hell. I won't have you raise your hand if anybody's ever said that to you. But there are these values, these, these cultural uh, realities in the Christian culture in 21st century America living alongside what I will call an irreligious religion. And, and there's a very strong irreligious culture in America as well. The culture of irreligious people says, I'm going to talk how I want, I'm going to vote how I want, I'm going to dress how I want, I'm going to sleep with whomever I want. And, and, and this is pursued with really religious fervor. And I would suggest to you this morning that even if you are an atheist, you are exercising a religious faith because you have to believe something to believe that there is no God. It's an act of faith. So we have in America these contrasting religions, Christianity, and of course there's lots of others that I'm not mentioning, but we have Christianity, we have atheism or irreligious people, and there's a culture clash when these things come into conflict. And it comes into the church because we have people who are very traditional in the church. We have people that have been brought up in faith. And, and my grandma washed my mouth out with soap if I said a bad word, right? Those kinds of people. And we've got people who have come to faith out of an irreligious culture and they don't get some of our rules. They, it just doesn't compute. And so we have a culture clash, even within the church. Does this make sense to you? And, and so this is how culture relates to religion. But here's what's interesting. Jesus took a very singular approach to religion. Jesus rejected the spirit of religion, and instead he came with a mission. I want to talk about Jesus and the mission. In Luke chapter 19, there's a great account. I love this account. One of my favorite stories in the Gospels of this short little man named Zacchaeus. Okay, if you grew up in Sunday school, you might have sung this song. Do you remember the song? Okay, stop now before we get off. off. Okay, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Remember? Okay, you're with me. The story goes like this, and, and I love it. Zacchaeus was so interested in Jesus, but he was so short that when Jesus came through his town and, and there was a crowd all around him, he couldn't see Jesus, and so he climbed a tree just to get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus, because he really loved people and he cared about people who were interested, who were pursuing God, he saw Zacchaeus in that tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm going to have dinner at your house today. Jesus invited himself over for dinner. 
to Zacchaeus' house. Now, Zacchaeus, if you don't know the story, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He worked for the Romans. Jewish people hated the Romans. They hated tax collectors because they represented the Romans. And so when the Jewish people saw that Jesus was going to go to Zacchaeus' house and hang out with him and probably be served bacon, oh my gosh, Jesus, you've got to be kidding me. Right? I mean, this is all the wrong thing. And so the people got all up into Jesus' grill and they're, and they're quizzing him about what's this all about. And this is what Jesus said. He said, listen, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. A few chapters earlier in the Gospel of Luke, there's a similar account in which these tax collectors and and notorious sinners were coming to Jesus and Jesus is hanging out with them, spending time with them, eating, drinking with them. And And it says that the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law began to complain that Jesus was associating with sinless people. Because at this point in Jesus's life, Jesus represented the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And so they were upset with Jesus because he's not upholding the Jewish religion, which means if you're one of those dirty people, I'm not going to have anything to do with you. So Jesus told the people a story, a parable. Jesus said, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And when he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors, and he will say, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. And in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and have never strayed away. This is the mission of Jesus, to seek and to save people who are lost. And here's the cool thing, and I know that you know this. Jesus invites us to join him on the mission. Jesus invites you and me to join him on the mission. Listen, it started when Jesus invited Peter to become a people fisher. John talked about that when he was talking about Trunk or Treat coming up this Saturday. We've been invited to be fishers of men, fishers of people, people that go out and, and we, we seek to develop relationships with people and, and hopefully bring them to Jesus. It's his mission. But what, what we see, and we're going to get there in 1 Corinthians in a minute, And what we see in our own culture is that there's a conflict between the mission of Jesus and the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion says, you need to conform to this culture and then you'll be in. The spirit of religion says you need to follow all these rules. Haven't you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? You need to tick all the boxes and then I will love you and I'm a representative of God's love. This is the spirit of religion. The mission of Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all you weary people that have been doing all the right things your whole life. He says, come to me, all who are weary. All who are weary. And this is is the important thing. If you get nothing else out of this message today, I hope you'll get this. Jesus gives us a strategy for the mission that sometimes we forget. Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Because you see, the Jews had the Ten Commandments. They had the 530-some commandments that they followed diligently. Jesus said, I'm giving you a new one. Here's the new one. It actually wasn't new because it was even in the Old Testament. But what he was saying is, this is the key. This is the key to the mission. Love one another. Love one another. 
In the same way I have loved you, you should love one another. And so this becomes the strategy for the mission, loving people well instead of rejecting people because they don't conform to our Christian culture. Somebody say you're still with me. Awesome, that was good. So here's what I want you to leave with today. This is the big idea. You can choose religion or you can choose the mission. You can choose religion or you can choose the mission And the reality is these two things will always be in conflict. There's always going to be a a friction between religion and the mission. And we're going to be confronted again and again and again over what we will choose. The spirit of religion is about behavior and rules and being good enough, while the mission of Jesus is about us loving other people well right where they are and helping them reconnect to God. We do that just by loving people well. So what will you choose? This is what Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And if you've got your Bibles open, now we're there, all right? Uh, And in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we we see Paul addressing the Corinthian Christians and this spirit of religion. Because there was this friction, there was this conflict happening right there. I want to pick it up in chapter 8, verse 4. Paul says, so what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Okay, now this might seem a little strange to our ears, because this really isn't an issue in 21st century America, but for the Corinthians, this was a big culture clash, because Corinthian Christians, eating meat that had been offered in a temple, that was an everyday practice. They would go to the temple, they would offer meat, that meat would sometimes be served to the people, other times it would be sold at the market, it was just everywhere in the culture, but there were Christians who had previously been Jews that are like, that is the devil's food, I'm not going to eat that, okay? And so there's this conflict in the Christian church, and, 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 and Paul is addressing it. He says, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and there is only one god. There may be so-called gods in both heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. And so he just begins to unpack this. Verse 7. He says, however, not all believers know that the idols are just fake gods. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real, so when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods, and their weak consciences are violated. And he talks about that a little bit more, and then, and then I'm skipping down to verse 13, and he says, so if what I eat, if what I eat causes another believer to sin, listen to Paul's heart here, I will never eat meat again as long as I live because I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Now, this is, this is extraordinary because Paul is addressing a religious spirit here. The religious spirit that is manifesting in these Corinthians is I know what is right and wrong. I know what I can do. I know the freedom I have in Christ. And I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't care who I offend. I'm going to be me and they can just be them and done deal. Paul is saying, listen, that's the spirit of religion when all the focus is on you, 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 instead of serving others in love, you've completely missed the point. You've missed the mission and you've just said yes to the spirit of religion that damages people. He flips it on its head. This is really interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he shares the other side of the coin. He says this, listen, if someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to, And eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. So what he's saying is, listen, if if you're with Christians that don't have the same conscience as you, 
They don't have the same freedom as you. Serve the weaker Christians. If you're with non-Christians who might be completely ignorant of your customs and your convictions, serve the non-Christians. What is important? What is important? Paul goes on to say what's important is the mission. Here's how Paul describes the mission. Chapter 9. Paul says, Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Does that that hit you like it hits me? I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Paul described his relationship to the mission of Jesus as slavery. In other words, he's going to give up all of his rights just to serve people because I have this singular purpose. I want to help people reconnect to God. I'm a slave to that mission. He says, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. And even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. Okay, what what, what he's saying here, if I can just paraphrase it for you, he's saying, listen, when I'm working at bringing Jewish people to know Jesus, I'm not going to offend them by eating bacon, okay? I'm not, I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to respect their customs. I'm going to respect their laws. And I know that in Christ I have all this freedom, but I'm not going to insist on my own rights because I'm trying to help people find Jesus. That, that's what he's saying. Do you know how far he went in that commitment to, to serving people? When he was in one Jewish community with his apprentice, Timothy, whose father was a Greek and his mother was a Jew, he arranged to have Timothy, his apprentice, circumcised so the Jews wouldn't be offended. Now, this was at the same time that Paul was arguing that circumcision was not necessary for for Christian faith. But if it became a stumbling block to Jewish people, Paul said, I will arrange to have Timothy circumcised. I'm not sure how Timothy felt about this. I'm not sure I would have been on board. That's extreme, is it not? But This is how committed Paul was to the gospel and to the mission of Jesus to seek and save those who are lost. But he doesn't stop there. Let's keep reading. Verse 21. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so I can bring them to Christ. There's the mission again. And then he gives us this caveat, but I do not ignore the law of God. I I obey the law of Christ. You remember what the law of Christ is? Love each other. Love each other. Which means I'm not going to sin against somebody out of selfishness, okay? But, but what he's saying is, listen, I'm, I'm, going over, I'm going over to this Gentile's house. We're having ham. Am I going to say no? And that shrimp cocktail... You remember Paul was a Jew, right? He was, he was raised a Jew. I don't think that shrimp cocktail probably tasted very good to him. But if it was going to prevent somebody from experiencing Christ, he's saying, I'm going to lay down my rights. I'm going to lay down my convictions. I'm going to lay down my tastes so that somebody can come to Jesus. Yeah. He said something really similar in Galatians chapter 5. The Galatians were struggling with this whole circumcision thing because some Jewish believers had come into the Galatian church and they were trying to get all the Christians circumcised. And so in Galatians, Paul is arguing against circumcision. And he says, you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Look at this. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Wow, he got it. He understood. He he understood Jesus. He understood Jesus' mission. He understood the strategy that when I love people well, they might come to Jesus. He wraps it up in verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 9. He says, when I'm with those who are weak, 
I share their weaknesses, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I find common ground with everyone. Would you just read that phrase? I try to find common ground with everyone. That was a little weak. You can do better. I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Now, I, I want to just offer a caveat right here. It's important for us to understand. You and I do not save people. Okay? Jesus saves people. Okay? Jesus saves people. And sometimes I think we get real discouraged because we share Christ with people or we love people really well and they walk away and they just, they, they just they, they reject the message and we feel bad because we didn't save them. Okay? It's really important to know your job, my job, is to love people well, represent Jesus well, and then let Jesus do the saving. And you know what? He's really good at it. Okay, I'm not going to go off on a tangent. So I want to ask you this question today. Will you choose religion or the mission? What are you going to choose? These two statements are key in my mind. Paul said, I've become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. And I try to find common ground with everyone. So now I'm going to wade into really risky waters. You ready? How do we apply this in our Christian culture? How do we live this out? I've got a few things I want to talk about. Let's talk about politics, shall we? Danger, danger, danger. I have really strong political convictions. I sometimes describe myself as being a political junkie because I love political podcasts, I like current events, I listen to the news. I have very strong political convictions. And, uh, and, and that's just a part of, uh, of my personality, it's part of my life, it's part of my, my convictions, really, right? But I understand at the core of who I am that who's in the White House is not going to usher in the kingdom of God. The Supreme Court of the United States, as important as it is, is never going to enforce the establishment of the kingdom of God in America. And I, I understand that if I'm not careful with my convictions about politics, if I'm not careful... I can become a distraction to people coming to Jesus if I try to cram politics down their throats. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so I pick and choose very deliberately who and when I'm going to have a conversation about politics. Okay? If I'm, if I'm talking to somebody that I know does not know Jesus... And, and I just want to love them well, and they want to talk about politics, I'm going to smile, and I'm going to shake my head, and I'm going to say, yes, I understand, and then I'm going to try to direct them to Jesus. I, I'm not going to cram my political stuff down their throats. Why? Because the White House is not going to bring the kingdom of God. Now, another day, Lucas and I are going to sit in a coffee shop, and we're going to talk about politics, and we're going to have a great time. Why? Because we love each other, we disagree about some things, we're, we're gonna wrestle, we're gonna explore ideas, we're gonna have a very respectful conversation, and at the end of that conversation, Lucas and I are both gonna be passionately in love with Jesus, okay? So I'm gonna be careful about cramming politics down the throats of my unbelieving friends, or even my friends who are new Christians who have different convictions. I might even say they aren't fully developed convictions, but even that sounds a little condescending, doesn't it? I might feel that way, but I'm not going to let politics get in the way of somebody coming to maturity in Jesus. Okay? I, I drove up this morning and I saw all our, our signs in the lawn for Trunk or Treat, and I have this conversation just about every year. Why is the church glorifying the devil's holiday? 
okay? That, that's, a, that's a question people come to me with every year. And, and I want to be really clear. As, as a follower of Jesus, I don't like Halloween. I don't like it. I don't like anything it stands for. I don't like the kingdom of darkness. I don't like the devil. I don't like witches. I don't like any of it. Okay? But I recognize that this is a huge cultural value in our culture. So I'm going to try to find common ground with the people who love costumes. And we're going to have an event, and we're going to have a prayer booth, and we're going to see if we can do a little damage to the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light on this campus. Okay? Hear what I'm saying? I don't, I don't have to approve of Halloween to be on mission in Halloween season. Okay? And I hope I didn't offend anybody there. Just talking about the difference between the spirit of religion and the mission of Jesus. Another thing, let's talk, let's talk about profanity. Let's talk about some of those words that we don't like. Again, like politics, there are words in the English language that I hate. Chris and I are sometimes watching TV and there's too much F words, and we just go, I, I just can't take it anymore. I, I, I just, I, this is not entertaining to me, let's watch something different, okay? I don't like the F word. I, there's words that some people consider profane that, frankly, I like them. I missed something over here, but let's not go there. <laughs> uh, sure, I'll give you an example. This is pretty benign. Um, my mother hates it when I use the phrase pissed off. I mean, she hates... Did you know the word piss is in the King James Version of the Bible? <laughs> I mean, when somebody was writing the Bible 500 years ago, translating the Bible 500 years ago, they used the word piss because that was, that was the word for that act, you know, and then somehow in the 20th century, it became a swear word, and my mother hates the word piss, and, and then, then everything changed, and, it, and, and we say, I got pissed off, and my mom is all, and I say it as a pastor, and she's like, you know, okay? Here's the thing, here's the thing, and, and I, I, hope, I hope you'll hear my heart here, because I think this is important for us as, as as people who are on mission. Profanity has become a ubiquitous part of our culture. And the F word in particular, it flows out of people's mouths, like some people who say like every third word, right? Some people, some people say the F word every third word, and it's just part of their language, and they're not talking about the, the act that it represents. It's just a punctuation mark in their sentence. And here's the problem. If I get all twisted up about the F word when I'm having a conversation with somebody, it can completely stop the conversation about Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a, in a counseling session with somebody and I become aware that they're self-editing. And as their emotion begins to bubble out, they will say, the F word or something else, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Russ, I know you're a pastor, I know I shouldn't, you know, and they're self-editing. I don't want people to self-edit for me. Because that doesn't hurt me in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't hurt me. I want to hear what they're wrestling with so I can help them come to Jesus and receive healing. You get it? Yeah. And it's the same thing, listen, it's the same thing with, with taking the Lord's name in vain. And I've, I've had some conversations with some of you connectors about this, and, it, and it's hard because as a Christian, I feel offended if somebody is disrespecting my Lord, right? We, we feel that way. But listen, if people aren't serving the Lord, can we expect them to honor the Lord with their language? No. And we can't get the cart before the horse. We've got to bring them to Jesus and let Jesus change them before we start talking about their behaviors, particularly their speech. Can we just get off the speech bandwagon? And, and this applies, listen, this applies to non-believers as well as newer believers. 
And, 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 and listen, what's bad and good in terms of profanity changes over time anyway. Pissed off is a good example. Used to be terrible, now it's everyday speech and nobody bats an eye except for my mom. <laughs> so I, I think it's wise if we're on mission to stop making a big deal about words and get focused on Jesus. Now, we could talk about sexuality, and I'm, I'm just going to touch on this too. Sometimes we get offended by the way people express their sexuality. And as Christians, we're like, I can't hang out with that person. I don't like their lifestyle. <laughs> Listen, what if, you, what, if, what if you bring them to Jesus? What if you get them connected to Jesus, and then Jesus changes their lifestyle? Is that not a win? And if I can love somebody right where they're at, is that not doing what Jesus did with Zacchaeus? Jesus didn't drag Zacchaeus out of the tree and say, listen, you got to stop working for Rome, okay? And then I'll come to your house once you've quit your job. I'll, I'll come to your house. No, Jesus went to his house, had dinner with him, and then he said, I'm going to give all the money I've stolen away to other, to, I'm, I'm going to give it all back. You see, when we encounter Jesus, he changes us. I'm not going to change anybody. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not that powerful. So I might as well quit trying and just love people well and introduce them to Jesus. That's the mission. Okay, now, I want to back up to the very beginning of 1 Corinthians 8. I want you to see something really powerful here. Very beginning of these two chapters that we're reading this week, Paul says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Say the word knowledge. All of us possess knowledge. What's he talking about? What's the knowledge? Well, the knowledge is probably doctrine. I know Jesus died for my sins. I know that Jesus was born of a virgin. Okay, that's knowledge. Knowledge is knowing what's right and wrong and what I should do, what I shouldn't do. That's knowledge. Knowledge is my personal convictions, okay? I know that I feel strongly about this and, and convict. Knowledge is all of the wisdom you would like to pass on to other people to save them from, their, from themselves. Knowledge, okay? Paul says we all have, and then he says this. Q. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This directly relates to this question of the spirit of religion versus the mission of Jesus. You can puff or you can build. You and I have known people who are all puffed up with their knowledge, right? We say they've got a big ego or they've got an inflated head. Do we like those people? Generally, no. But do you know how easy it is to be those people? And we get all puffed up, and, and I think sometimes we think that it's really benign, that kind of arrogance and self being self-impressed and self-righteousness. We think that it's really not that bad. But I, I, I want you to think about this idea of being puffed up and and animals in the animal kingdom that puff. Think about porcupines, okay? Do you know that a porcupine, when it gets threatened, literally puffs itself up and spreads all of its quills out? And if you run into a porcupine, when those quills are all puffed up, what's going to happen? Not going to be good. There's an animal in the sea called a puffer fish. And the puffer fish, oh, isn't he cute? He's real cute until you run into him while you're scuba diving and you poke him and you bleed so bad you have to surface right away. There are snakes that puff up when they're threatened. And my, my personal favorite is the horned lizard. I think this is from Australia, the horned lizard. When they are threatened, they puff their bodies up. He looks kind of cute too because he's smiling there. But what that... What that what that lizard does is he puffs up and he shoots blood out of his eyes. 
Listen, what I'm trying to get to you, get, get through to you is this. If we puff ourselves up because we know so much, we're going to do a whole lot of damage to a whole lot of people. Jesus says, Paul says, love builds up. It builds, it builds, it builds. It builds. I love somebody well, and I overlook their faults. I overlook their behaviors that are offensive to me, but I just say, listen, I love you right where you are. Can I introduce you to Jesus? They say yes. And Jesus becomes the foundation. And then I begin to invest in that person. And I say, hey, I love you so much. I want to help you grow and get to know Jesus better. Have you considered reading your Bible? And I, and I, I build another brick in that wall. And then, and then one day we're talking about some stuff and, and I say, you know, You've got some behaviors here that are going to be spiritually destructive in your life. And I want you to be blessed. I don't want you to live under a curse. I want you to be blessed. Have you considered that maybe because you love Jesus, he would help you change this? And I start building and building and building until pretty soon there's what Paul calls a temple that I've built brick by brick through love. And I've watched this happen in real time. The first, the first person who ever said yes to Jesus when we launched Connect Church 15 years ago, he became a brand new Christian. He'd been raised in an irreligious community. And, and this young man was living with his girlfriend. They were engaged to be married in Maui a year later. And as he and I began to develop a relationship and, and, and I was just helping him follow Jesus, uh, I, I talked to him about his, uh, his living arrangement, living with his girlfriend. And she'd actually gotten pregnant. So we were having a conversation. I said, listen, I know you've got this big party planned in Maui a year from now. But because Jesus asked us to be married, would you consider, Chris and I will just meet you down by the Gallatin River. There's this pretty little quiet spot. We'll have a little ceremony. We'll get you married and, and, and you'll, just, you'll just be blessed by Jesus to get married. And then I said to him, Chris and I will go to Maui with you to have the party a year from now. You know what he said? He said, how soon can we do it? And, and it was one of those moments in my life where I'm like, wow, Jesus, when we do what you call us to do, it really works. I didn't start by saying, listen, you can't be a Christian until you move out of your girlfriend's house. Started with Jesus and then build the bricks with love. Does that make sense? You want to hear the end of this story with Anthony? Here's what Anthony Ray Hinton said in his speech the other night. He said, I had every right to be bitter and angry. I had every right to hate white people, especially Klan members. But when Henry Hayes came into his book club, instead of hating him and rejecting him, rejecting him, he instead chose to love him. They became friends. In fact, Anthony said he loved Henry. This white man who had mutilated and lynched a teenage black boy. How in the world could Anthony love this man who had committed such a horrific crime? The day came when Henry Hayes was due to be executed. And on execution day, the state of Alabama would give uh, the prisoner two requests. You would get a last meal, whatever you wanted to eat, and you would get to make a final statement. And Henry asked if he could share his last meal with Anthony in his cell. This was against the rules, but the guards had compassion on Henry and Anthony and knew they were close friends, so they let them share this meal together in Anthony's jail cell. 
And when it was time for Henry to go to the execution, Anthony asked, can I give my friend a hug? Another thing that's against the rules. And Anthony wrapped his arms around Henry and whispered in his ear, Henry, I love you. And he said, I'm gonna see you on the other side. They strapped Henry into the the electric chair there in Alabama, and they asked him for his last statement. And they recorded his last statement, and Anthony shares it in his book. This is how Henry left this world. He said, all my life I've been taught to hate. The very people I was taught to hate actually taught me to love. And tonight as I leave this world, I am leaving this world knowing what love feels like. And because Anthony, because Anthony didn't capitulate to the spirit of religion that says, justice means I reject this man. That's the spirit of religion. Instead, he said, the mission of Jesus is I love this man who is utterly unlovable. Henry's in the presence of Jesus and he's waiting for Anthony to join him there. That's the mission of Jesus. Will you choose the mission? Can we walk away from the spirit of religion and stay on mission for Jesus? That would be your cue to say, yes, Pastor Ross, I will. Yes. Let's pray. Why don't you stand to your feet? Come on and pray with me. Jesus, I think we all know that the spirit of religion is so deceptive and it's so easy for us to become inflated in our egos and, 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 and treat people badly because they offend our sensibilities. And Jesus today with one voice, I think, In this room, we want to say we are saying no to the spirit of religion and we are saying yes to the spirit of Jesus that puts us on mission. Jesus, for the the times that we have been arrogant and self-impressed and we have rejected people that you called us to love, Lord, we, we just ask you to forgive us and we ask you, Lord, to turn our hearts so that we can love with our whole hearts, that we can love like Jesus loved. Help us to see people like Zacchaeus who are hungry for Jesus and all they need, all they need is a little bit of love and their whole life is gonna be transformed. Help us to see them and Jesus, help us to love them well. We thank you, Lord, in your name we pray.